if we're here for anything, it's to experience beauty and to recognize it and shout it from the rooftops when we see it and to celebrate it. And if you just do that in your day to day, if you dig into beauty and you start making sure that everything you do is grounded back to a pursuit of beauty, you're going to find a different life and you will save the American people from collapse in the process. And you will show the world that we can build a nation that's not about empires and sequestration of power and wealth and resources. We're about great co-creation. I think that's one of the shining lights of the American people is we are a profoundly creative group because we've been empowered at the self level. If we start to mimic the communication network that we found in the microbiome and we start to build societies like that, that's how we're going to escape this extinction event that we're headed towards. And we can start doing it by just being a co-creative society again, connecting humans to be co-creative rather than consumptive. And uh, the world is our oyster. That's Zach Bush, MD. And this is The Rich Roll Podcast. Rich Roll Podcast. Hey, everybody. How you guys doing? Are you hanging in there? How is the sequestration going, the physical distancing? How are the loved ones holding up? How is the close proximity impacting your relationships with those with whom you have sequestered? I'm Rich Roll, and I hope you're taking care of yourselves because this, my friends, is not a drill. This is not the moment to slack off. It is indeed self-care go time now more than ever. It's time to eat the good foods, get the sleep, drink the fluids, move the body, and to get creative with your families, with your kids, and of course, with yourself. And I think without, of course, minimizing the extreme severe hardship so many of us are currently facing, at the same time, I really can't overstate the unprecedented opportunity that we're being gifted with right now to go inward, to confront and overcome the fear that accompanies our inability to control what is happening and instead invest in the things that we can control, our minds, our bodies, our emotional state, our spiritual state. And I think of it much like an addict's moment of clarity, this truly singular and shared moment that we find ourselves in that presents us with this opportunity to look at and hopefully break the chains of denial that imprison us, this occasion to examine and reimagine behaviors that don't serve us, an economic system that demands constant growth at the cost of the collective good, a political system that preys on fear to divide us, a conglomerated food apparatus that foments disease, and then the pharmaceutical complex that then relies upon those diseases to create dependency. And ultimately, this collective obsession that we have with ego, with power, with money, and material consumption that is rapidly eroding our biosphere and degrading our integrity and separating us from ourselves and from others and from our innate divinity. And my hope is that we can emerge from this collective experience, this hardship, this massive planetary wake up call, not as victims, but empowered, armed with greater clarity to reimagine and ultimately actualize a better, more sustainable, purposeful, intentional, and fulfilling life experience for ourselves, for our loved ones, for future generations, and frankly, the world at large. And look, it's hard, I know. There's a lot of suffering right now. Lives are being lost, jobs are disappearing. Layoffs are happening everywhere. The economy is teetering and we just don't know what the future will bring, which is admittedly, truly scary and yet, When you cut through all the fear, the anxiety, and the uncertainty, I see humanity rising. I see incredible creativity everywhere I look, and I'm uplifted by the heroes that walk among us. So many selfless souls putting themselves in harm's way, sacrificing 
their own personal well-being to treat the ill and provide us with food and the critical goods and services that we need to survive. So please don't let this pass without reflection. This is not the moment for Netflix and chill, but to engage your imagination, to recognize the opportunity for reinvention, to find the sliver of joy that it presents to celebrate our shared humanity, to confront and accept and embrace and find grace in the essential truth that despite the chaos, amidst the chaos, that control is and has always been an illusion. We never truly know what the future holds. All we have is this moment and the choices it presents. With that being said, I can think of few people better equipped to traverse this terrain than my friend, Dr. Zach Bush, alongside me today for his fourth appearance on the show. It was recorded just a few days ago. It is well worth your undivided attention and it's coming up in a few. But first, we're brought to you today by Athletic Greens. If you've tuned into this show, I suspect that you already know how I feel about keeping your nutrition in check. Bottom line, it is the key to optimal health, maximum recovery, and performance gains. Look, nobody maintains an absolutely perfect diet 100% of the time. So it's important to have a nutritional insurance policy to make sure that your body is getting the essentials it needs on the daily. I've tried a lot of this stuff out there. Some are better than others. Most products for me are one and done, but I gotta say that Athletic Greens Ultimate Daily Formula has really stood the test of time and has become this critical component in my everyday regimen. And there's a couple important reasons for this. One, it's super convenient. I keep the travel packs in my car, in my backpack, and in my office, so I always have a healthy go-to. Second, it tastes damn good and it dissolves super easy. These are highly underrated pluses. But most importantly, it's an all-in-one superfood powerhouse, replete with all the essential vitamins and minerals, 75 different whole food sourced ingredients, scientifically designed to not only improve immunity, but also increase energy, support recovery, gut health, and healthy aging, which is super important to me. Everything is sustainably sourced. There's nothing artificial. There's no harmful ingredients. It's vegan. It's also gluten and dairy-free. No added sugar, just all the good stuff. If you're in the US, Canada, the UK, or Europe, you can get 20 free travel packs valued at $79 with your first purchase when you go to athleticgreens.com forward slash rich roll. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash rich roll. Take your nutrition to the next level with Athletic Greens. We're also brought to you today by Health IQ because life insurance, my friends, needed a reboot. Just as you're taking responsibility for your nutrition, I got an inkling you're also taking responsibility for your health and for your fitness. Should that be the case, as I suspect? I'm also willing to bet that you're overpaying for your life insurance because for whatever strange reason, life insurance companies historically don't take proactive healthy lifestyle factors into account when calculating your premiums. And that is just not right. So Health IQ was founded to do what makes sense, reward your healthy lifestyle with rates that take your healthy habits into account. Here's how they do it. Health IQ puts on the propeller hat and uses science and data to secure lower rates for fit and healthy people. They can save you up to 41% because the physically active have significantly lower risks for heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Science people. To see if you qualify, go to healthiq.com forward slash rich roll and take their Health IQ quiz. Depending upon your score, as well as other related qualifying factors, you can save up to 41% on your life insurance premiums compared to other providers. There's no commitment, and you'll learn even more about potential opportunities to be rewarded for your commitment to living healthy. One more time, go to healthiq.com slash richroll. And finally, we're brought to you by ExpressVPN. You've heard me talk about the importance of having a VPN before. But in case you don't have one, look, you gotta get one ASAP because protecting your personal data online is no longer negotiable. It's just a must. I was a lawyer for many years, and so I understand the impact of sensitive data falling into the wrong hands. And I have several friends who've suffered the horrible consequence of identity theft. You don't want that. And as somebody who travels a ton, 
at least until recently, and spends more time than I care to admit on sketchy public Wi-Fi in hotel rooms and coffee shops. I've learned just how vulnerable we all are and thus how crucial it is to protect yourself with a VPN. I've done my research, I've tried a bunch of VPNs, and I can say with full confidence that ExpressVPN is the best on the market. Here's why. First, ExpressVPN doesn't log your data, unlike lots of really cheap or free VPNs, which make money by selling your data to ad companies. In fact, ExpressVPN developed a specific technology called Trusted Server that makes it impossible for their servers to log any of your info. The second is speed. Many VPNs slow your connection down or make your device sluggish. I've been using ExpressVPN for over a year now with zero negative impact on my internet speed or my device speed. But the thing that really sets VPN apart is how easy it is to use. You don't have to input or program anything. You just fire up the app and click one button and you're connected, that's it. So protect yourself with the VPN that I use and trust. Use my link, expressvpn.com slash richroll and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash richroll. Visit expressvpn.com slash richroll to learn more. Zach Bush, you know this guy, right? He's a show favorite. Longtime listeners are well acquainted with today's guest by way of his many past appearances. In addition to being a renowned multidisciplinary physician of internal medicine, endocrinology, and hospice care, as well as a recognized educator on the microbiome, Zach is also the founder of Seraphic Group, which is an organization devoted to root cause solutions for human and ecological health. He's also the founder of Farmers Footprint, a nonprofit coalition of farmers, educators, doctors, scientists, and business leaders aiming to expose the human and environmental impacts of chemical farming and offer a path forward, helping farmers with the transition to regenerative agricultural practices. To me, beyond the resume, Zach is point blank a master healer. He's a friend, he's a critical voice in the conversation we need to have in this unprecedented moment of global calamity. And he's here today to share his unique perspective on the coronavirus epidemic, what is happening, how to best navigate it, what it signifies for humanity, social, economic, and political systems, and the future of planetary ecology. This is my first attempt in many years, since the earliest days of the podcast, in fact, at recording a podcast remotely. And I admit to a great aversion and almost allergic reaction to this dynamic. Uh, Being physically present with the person I'm speaking with is at the very core of what I do. However, sequestration demands I adapt. And so this is my fairly reluctant attempt to do just that. Therefore, you're gonna have to excuse the audio quality. Although our voices are perfectly understandable, it remains a somewhat eroded version of what you come to expect. The bandwidth at my home is subpar, a function of living a bit in the middle of nowhere. Zach was recording from Oahu, which also doesn't have great internet. And this combined produced a latent delay and required that we avoid talking over each other, which impeded the natural conversational flow and our ability to communicate organically and making for more of a staccato back and forth kind of exchange. But disclaimer aside, and is always the case with Zach, I think you will find this to be equal parts instructive, enlightening and moving, especially the end. So please listen all the way to the end. Zach has a knack for landing our podcast with unmatched profundity in what is essentially a masterclass in thinking both deeply and broadly about this unique situation we are collectively experiencing. I love this man, I'm grateful for his wisdom and I'm proud to share it with you guys today. So without further ado, this is me and Dr. Zach Bush. In thinking about who I wanted to talk to, about 
you know, what's happening globally and the plight and the opportunity that humanity is currently facing, I could think of no better person to host this conversation with me than yourself. So thanks for coming um, on the show today. And perhaps we can just open it up with, you know, how are you faring and, you know, navigating all of this? I know you were in Fiji and now you're in Oahu. Yeah, it's been a very smooth process for me. I know there's a lot of people that are under more severe duress around the world right now, but the last month of travel has been interesting for me in that I've gotten to see a number of different, you know, peoples and cultures responding to this global emergency and Australia was an uh, interesting space to be in. There's certainly a sense of um we've been there, done that in regards to Uh, apocalyptic disasters there in Australia. They just came through the fires. And I think that they're very aware that there is, you know, a stressor going on on this planet in regard to ecologic and physical stress that's unprecedented in scale. And they've, you know, lived through that and many have died in that. And uh, the tragedies uh, at the humanitarian level on one side, but then just the, the loss of life of animals and everything else was just of a scale that really has not been seen. And so I think this feels like, you know, a much lesser evil in some ways than the apocalyptic fires had. And so I think there's a different energy there than we see in the United States. And then in Fiji, you know, you're looking at a developed country uh, or developing country that it you know, has no infrastructure uh, at play. And, I started my medical journey in the Philippines and did six months of work with an international group of midwives there, birthing babies in the squats of the Philippines and was routinely in hospitals that never have any resources, you know? And so I think when you're in a Fiji or a Philippines or Africa or, you know, parts of Central America in these war tour countries, Honduras and the like, you know, the this is a daily plight for them. They never have the resources to Mm -hmm. deliver the healthcare that, you know, the modern technology would be capable of. They never have adequate supplies. They never have, you know, adequate beds to address it. They don't have the expertise to address just the the usual. And so what we're experiencing in the United States, particularly in New York City right now, is intense. And my my heart and gratitude goes out to those doctors that are in the midst of, you know, overwhelming demand on the on their system there in New York. Um, but I think as a country, we do need to be cognizant of just how dire the situation is day in and day out just to deliver normal care in so much of the world and uh, running out of hospital masks and things like that is, I think the rest of the world might look at that and be like, well, join the, join the party. And right uh, so here is here a is a little bit of danger of it. <laughs> our version of what it's like to be in the developing world and being very much caught off guard. You know, there's the perspective of of us just being, you know, horrifically uh, unprepared to manage what's coming at us and what's developing at such a rapid pace, but also this sense that um, it's a it's a trial run for something much, much worse. And, you know, I, I, I hold out hope not to minimize what's happening at all because it's, it's absolutely horrific, um, but that it will be a wake up call for us moving forward to get our act together, not just in the United States, but globally so that we can unite and be better prepared for when a more virulent um, version of what we're experiencing right now inevitably visits us. Yeah, I think that that's the unfortunate reality. And I've gotten some flashback for some of the comments I've made towards that end on social media and such, just reminding ourselves that, you know, not only is this not as bad as it could be, it's going to get worse if we continue on our course. And uh, people have said, you're downplaying this. And I think my point is, no, I'm actually playing this like this is literally a symptom of collapse of biology on the planet and if we do not pay heed and if we just continue to blame this virus as if this is our problem then we're not then we're going to walk into the collapse of of civilization we're going to walk into the collapse of an entire species over the next 100 years and what is that going to look like it's Mm -hmm. certainly not going to look like intact supply chains and intact you know 
you know, electricity and plumbing and everything else that we're enjoying right now in this country, like, I, I really think that if, if we continue to walk by these warning signs of climate change, you know, fires in Australia, you know, all the way down to, you know, our public health crisis with chronic diseases, if we continue to walk by these and, you know, bemoan our, our problems or whatever and not start to really fundamentally change who we are and how we act on this planet, this is just the the, the slightest of warm up or you know curtain calls for for what's to come, and I, it, it's heartbreaking that this is all preventable. We know how to change the course of history, and we're not doing it. And so um, I I agree with you that we we need to be sobered by this. We need to take the the full impact of loss of life that we've seen across the world, the full impact of the economic and financial crisis that's upon families, certainly in, you know, in the United States. But again, just having been in a developed country, you know, Fiji is really concerned because they are a cash society that lives, you know, day to day subsistence. And they're all being told there's not going to be any of your primary industry of tourism coming into your country for probably six months. And, mm -hmm. you know, so that it's, you can't measure that on the U.S. mindset, you know, scale of what we're, what's happening around the world as we make these decisions. So um, I think that we have to be constantly putting the current situation in the perspective of the greater context if it's going to be teaching us the lessons that I really believe this virus is trying to teach us. Mm -hmm. What is uniquely distinct about this situation is that no life is left unaffected, you know, in contrast to, you know, the horrific fires in Australia or uh, even 9-11 on some level. In the current scenario, whether you're the shopkeeper or the billionaire or the homeless person or, you know, the average, you know, soccer mom, there is no person who is unaffected by what's happening. And, what makes that interesting is it's incredible power to unite us around a singular cause. And the optimist in me is hopeful that not only will this be a wake up call, but it will be a trigger that will set in motion a series of events that will you know, hopefully um, change our current operating system and how we're treading on the planet. And yet at the same time, I juxtapose that against the power structure that currently exists. And I see the opportunity for a tremendous consolidation of power in this moment, which causes me concern. And so I'm interested in, in you know, how, you know, the sort of uh, war between optimism and pessimism works in your mind. Uh, as usual, you frame things so beautifully. Um, that's a perfect, description of the situation we're in. I um, have been struggling to, to explain that situation, you know, in other spaces and social media and everything else without upsetting people because the natural reaction, unfortunately, in our current vibration as humanity is not to go to that space of singularity of, oh my gosh, we are all one. We are all in this together, whether we're an earthworm or a human or Chinese or American, we're, we're in this together is not the reaction. And I, I still am amazed that that doesn't work because it seems so obvious. Like this is the thing. This is our opportunity. Let's rise. Let's, let's break down the boundaries. Let's break down the barriers. Let's break down the nationalism. Let's break. And yet the vibration we're still stuck in is, is that fear resonates better than hope. And we're in a state where, you know, retracting to likeness rather than, you know, wholeness is what we tend to do. And so I got totally attacked last Friday on social media for mentioning that China is actually successfully getting on top of their situation and they're seeing a massive reduction in the crisis on their side. And the amount of negative energy towards China was unbelievable on the, on the comments. They were saying, well, I don't believe anything coming out of China. They're draconian measures, blah, blah, blah. They're military state. And 
Well, they have made some really drastic changes that they felt like were necessary to protect a, a population of 1.28 billion people. And it's not done how things are done in the United States. And their people may protest on some level, but they successfully got on their problem. And you know, there's a lot of evidence that they got on it very quickly in the sense that they, they started six new hospitals in the capital of uh, you know, the, the epicenter there and all, all six of those, you know, hospitals have already shut their doors cause they were able to empty them out. So that mm -hmm. it, it was just an incredible speed at which they were able to achieve those results. And they're really looking to the fact that yes, the, the measures of that they took were probably helping it, but they also are doing a lot of work right now. The brilliant Chinese scientists right now doing the more important work in some ways of saying, why were people dying? Who was dying? And it wasn't from the virus because the virus didn't affect most people severely. And and so they're really working hard. And some great papers are coming out. Just one a couple of days ago came out and that was brilliant looking at uh, the microbiome of, of those that died. And it seems to be a unifying effect more than even age is, you know, the, the, the collapse of the microbiome in the gut was predicting vulnerability to this virus. And so I see our Chinese you know, com compatriots in science and in, in, you know, real critical thought here being really leading the charge on helping the rest of the world. And yet the world is making these, you know, horrifically closed minded statements and belief systems about, you know, this country that's working so hard to recover from what is undoubtedly the biggest, you know, economic blow they've ever had. And interestingly, at the same time, we have, in the same series of comments, you see people, you know, complaining that because Chinese supply lines have been shut down, their hospital doesn't have enough masks and everything else. And so it, it's just interesting that as a country, we go into this nationalistic mindset. We go into this, you know, everybody else is evil and we're the, we're the white horse and we, we trust our media, but Chinese media is lying to us all the time. And how can we possibly be trusting our media? And all of a sudden, because certainly right before this happened, we didn't trust our media. And so why in a time of crisis do we suddenly blindly think that the United States is the, the harbinger of all truth and everybody else is lying? And the same thing's happening in Russia. Russia is actually weathering this storm quite well right now. And everybody just says, well, Putin's lying. Well, well <laughs> that's... If that's your response, the, you know, then then why did we do what we did as a country? Why did we outsource all of our, you know, supply for medical and beyond, uh, our food system, et cetera, our waste system to China? If we if we're that distrustful of them, if they're that incompetent, if and why did we outsource our our space program to Russia if they're always lying and incompetent and blah blah blah? It, it's just not true. These countries have incredible assets, attributes, you know, truths that are n not familiar to us in a lot of ways. And therefore we doubt them and we, we are suspicious of them. We should always question the data. We should always ask, you know, are we, are we seeing the objective data? And oftentimes we're not, but I would say that the likelihood of us seeing truth and objectiveness from U S media more so than Russia or China, is no longer the case. Maybe there was some golden age in American journalism that that was the case, but we all have to know that our media is fully bought and paid for, just as our politicians are fully bought and paid for over and over again. And so uh, I don't understand why we, why we collapse away from the opportunity of that singularity you described there. Uh, I think we have the opportunity to do that. And I think there's large sectors of our population that are doing that and are ready to rise and are ready to say we are one. And I, I see that so true in your audience, Rich. You've inspired people. That's why they tune in over and over again to your show is because they, they feel the, the gravity of truth, the gravity of real experience being shared and viewed and difficult questions being asked on your show all the time. And we are hungry for that truth. We're hungry for that and so I know that society is r r rising, and so I think that's my optimism: is that the people are rising. However, we're rising against a mechanistic system that has 
become extremely powerful at at suppressing the common you know sentiment or the common vibration and replacing it with fear and domination and the fact that we since 911 have gotten very used to our civil liberties being taken away from us in in justification for safety is interesting i i mm. you know is it wrong for us to be sequestered away no i think we i think it's totally appropriate for us to take the appropriate public measures to reduce the speed at which this virus is going to travel through our system and and we should not be mistaken this virus is all over the world it's going to continue to infect every vulnerable and person out there it will just go slower you know as we do this like we can't stay sequestered in our houses for the next two years and the last coronavirus that hit us i, I don't know if people remember but we, we already saw a global coronavirus scare with with sars back in 2001 2003 um and that went out way after two years and the science people still don't understand why it went away. It doesn't make sense that it did, but it did, which we can get into later is like, where are these coronaviruses coming from and why? <laughs> but, but um, you know, two years is too long for us to hide away and stay away from work and everything else. So we're, we're going to get back in the game and we're all of our immune systems are going to be challenged with this virus. And some of us will get sick and some of us will get severe, severely ill and some of us will, will die. And in the meantime, you know, where do we, where do we stay lucid? Where do we stay aware of civil liberties? And uh, so I think that that balance is going to be, you know, extremely tricky just as it was in the wake of 9-11. It was very difficult for people to question the story that was being put out by our media for 9-11. They would get just trashed by everybody, uh, politicians on down to the the man on the street. And so I think we're in another one of those situations where if you raise your head slightly above the, the, the current approved journalistic message of fear, you're going to be shot down. And that's just dangerous for us as a people if we if we continue to tolerate that level of suppression of, of questioning. It doesn't mean we're disobedient. I think that we can be very respectful and compliant with, you know, the social distancing and the quarantines and everything else we're going to call this stuff. But we have to also be very cognizant of personally, why are you doing that? Are you doing that for the greater good? And where, where are you maintaining your sense of civil liberties in the midst of that? And Mm -hmm. I think that that civil liberties comes in and the ability for us to question while we're being compliant. And uh, we should really question everything (laughs) all the time when it comes to massive efforts like are being currently being happening Mm -hmm. um you know we are in this post-truth fake news era and that is a breeding ground for fear and suspicion and conspiracy a level of distrust um, that i think also foments the nationalism to which you were speaking about and by dint of autocratic rule, you know, China really was able to marshal resources quickly and effectively. And by all accounts, they are, you know, on the other side of this. I know economically they're starting to get back to normal. Things are starting to ship from there once again. Um, and we've all seen images and videos of protocols that they put in place at the airports, et cetera, to effectively test people. And I think that part of what's informing the fear response here is we don't know who to trust or what's true and what's not true. What we do know is there aren't enough tests. The tests aren't accessible. So the numbers are probably higher than what we suspect because of that. And also it's illustrating the fragility of our systems. Like when one cog suddenly breaks, the whole system of global infrastructure quickly begins to become dismantled. And I think that also breeds fear when people look at the economic landscape of what's happening now and what is surely to come, the domino impact long-term of the stoppage and the slowdown that we're experiencing right now. So I'm empathetic to the fear response because on some level that's a very human response and it is frightening right now for people uh, to be 
feeling vulnerable about their personal health and also about the prospect of how they're gonna sort of make their way in the world once the you know sort of initial threat of this begins to lift and we have to kind of reckon with the economic wreckage and how to put that back together. So I think it would be helpful for people to kind of provide a little perspective or guidance on the opportunity aspect of this um, for those that are sequestered right now and are trying to figure out how to make productive use of this moment of isolation. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, there's a lot there. The, the opportunity has never been bigger. You know, I really feel extremely excited about that. And the opportunities are multifaceted here. You know, on the topic of supply chains and everything else that you just described, um, the United States needs to wake up to what it's done in the mission of making more money. We created Chinese supply lines for our hospitals and for many facets of our economy to make more money. We exploited cheap Chinese labor and efficient and intelligent you know, production systems that the Chinese have put into to place over the years. We exploited that so that our companies can make more money. And now hospitals are like, why don't we have masks? It's because you wanted to pay half a cent or one cent less for each mask that you were going to buy. So you outsourced that to China and the companies in the U.S. that used to make those masks went out of business. And so, you know, our businesses and their supply lines in the mission of making more money have made us very vulnerable. As consumers, we've driven much of that. We continue to be very short-sighted and really blind to the reality and the impact of our consumer decisions. We want the 99 cent chicken breast. We want, you know, the $1.49 six pack of sodas, you know, whatever it is, we continue to want these extremely subsidized and artificial, you know, price points on our our food system is probably the best example, but it's really every product out there from your respirator in the ICU all the way to the strap on your purse. You know, it's just like these things got outsourced because we wanted things to be cheaper and we wanted more things. And so the opportunity that we have right now is to re reevaluate that of like, what do you actually want? Do you actually want a 99 cent check and breast or would you like health? Do you want that hospital system to be the biggest economy in the U.S.? Or would you like to see our farmers uh, regain the, you know, the status of the largest economy on the planet? Because just, you know, we our, our food system is like $1.2 trillion a year. Our medical system is, is $3.7 trillion a year. And so we're, we're three times outspending our food with just the cost of chronic disease care. So what, what do we want? Do we want cheap food or do we want good health? And so the opportunity here is as we sit at home with our loved ones, let's start reevaluating our supply chain and in the household. How do you start to reclaim autonomy? And it's super cheap and awesome to do it. Some simple things are buy a cabbage or even better, start to grow a cabbage. We have spring coming on, which means the end of flu season, the end of coronavirus season is going to be here just out of the nature of the Northern Hemisphere going into to warmer weather is going to be good for everything. Um, but we're about to, to see spring hit. And so as spring sets in, right now, this week, sit down with your kids, your family, and start mapping out the garden that you never planted before or and start with a couple of containers if it's intimidating to do anything else or you don't have the space. Start with a couple of container plants and put them on your porch or put them on your, in your window. And let's start growing stuff again. And that's where this shift is going to begin is where is your supply line? Do you know it? If you're not going to grow your food, then start to know your farmers. Our work with Farmers Footprint the last couple of years has just been you know, so sobering to see how devastated our, our, in our national you know, food system is, and nowhere is that devastation felt stronger than the farmers themselves that are losing, you know, 6,000, 8,000 family farms a year now, and suicide rates have never been so high. You know, the dairy industry is an interesting one for you and I that are, you know, plant-based fanatics. It's, it, it, you know, we were part of this movement mm -hmm. of changing demand, but then the bottom fell out of the dairy industry the last year as we went into these 
trade wars with China and everything else, uh, we the the bottom dropped out, and the American Dairy Co-op, which is the largest co-op of dairy farmers in the country, uh, you know, all the milk gets shipped to their distribution centers, and then they send back checks to the farmers. And those checks got so small this past year and a half uh, that uh, they started the practice of sending out suicide hotlines with every single paycheck because uh, farmers are killing themselves at unprecedented rates as as the the crisis really hits them full force. And so we need to know those farmers again. We need to reconnect and tell them what we want, which is we want real food and we want really healthy food. And so if there's no dairy industry demand, we're going to help you make the transition to, to making oat milk or making whatever it is that is in demand, you know, and we would like mm-hmm. to actually see some real fruits and vegetables and unprocessed foods coming into every state again. Uh, we, we stopped growing food in the United States. If you think we have a serious crisis on you know, our hospitals right now, wait until our food system is disrupted. It's one thing when you don't have you know, hospital masks to take care of the critically ill. It's another thing when literally every single household doesn't have food. And that's the scenario we've set ourselves up for in the United States. In Kansas, which is our most agricultural state in the country, 90% of the acreage in Kansas is agriculturally managed. And they import 90% of their food as a state. And one in four children in Kansas is going hungry for lack of calories today. And so when we started this chemical farming you know, mission in the last you know 30 years, the whole mission was to feed the world. And we wake up 30 years later to find out, no, we just made multi-mega billion dollar corporations much richer through buying all their chemicals, but we completely lost our autonomy to feed ourselves, let alone the world in that process. The world is feeding us today and the supply chain is you know, tenuous and the, the reservoirs are, are low. And so, you know, every city is now an Island. It cannot produce its own, you know, you know, electricity, let alone its own, you know, food system. So it's time to start taking that back again. And, you know, my wife and I, and, and one of our friends that's on quarantine with us from coming back from travels sat around last night uh, and there's candlelight sitting here burning in the, in the living room. Lights were off, and I was, you know, kind of getting myself into a space where I, I could talk coherently. I hope today, and in that process, it was just so peaceful. There's just a sense of like, man, I don't need the lights on. I've got a candle. I've, you know, we need to grow some plants on the back porch. We need to, you know, it's so simple. The moves we need to make to completely change the vulnerability that we have at a health level, at a, at a food supply level, at a healthcare crisis level, we need to take these steps at the individual level and the whole system will change around us very rapidly. And I'm very excited for, you know, our, our companies to have to, to change with us. I'm excited that the dairy industry is being called to change. I'm sad that the, the American government is continues to subsidize collapse rather than, you know, foster change. Um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, if we connect with those farmers, they're going to show us the path. If we connect with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the energy sector on a more personal level, instead of just flipping on our lights and start to really think about what is energy and where does it come from? What does it mean to live in an air conditioned space 24 seven, where the temperature is always 72 degrees to 75 degrees, no matter what time of year, what does that mean for my health? Is it actually good for me to, to have windows closed and, and heating and air conditioning on year round? And the answer, of course, is, well, no, it's you, you're completely isolated away from nature there. And so what does nature start to look like in your daily life again? And we have this awesome opportunity right now to do that. And, you know, I was excited when San Francisco asked their population to, to voluntarily restrict their activities and restrict themselves to the homes or parks and national parks, trails, nature areas. <laughs> so I thought that was mm-hmm. brilliant for San Francisco to say, stay away from each other to reduce the spread of this virus, but get out in nature whenever possible. And you know that needs to be our mindset. And so take a look at your, your requests from your local governments and see if they're saying that you can't go outside at all, which is really not happening anywhere. They're basically saying, stay out of public places, stay away from one another, and let's see where it goes. And 
If it gets more dogmatic than that, then we should raise concern to our public officials and say, look, it's really important for the health of our children that they're outside. And if we just put them inside for the next you know, three months or whatever is being demanded, their health is going to really uh, be undermined. And we're going to see younger and younger people uh, you know, coming under the, the, the effects of this virus if we, if we make ourselves unhealthy in the mission of isolation. Uh, human isolation is a horrible thing. And it's been you know, maybe the silver lining of, of the social media world is that people are really, you know, reconnecting in a million unique ways. And I'm a little bit disturbed by just the amount of human effort being put into creating clever memes right now. But if, if that's what we need to do to stay connected, maybe that's <laughs> the vibration we're in. Um, but I hope that, you know, as you get bored of making memes, you start to really turn your attention towards these bigger opportunities that the time is providing you as sit down with your loved ones, whether that's, you know, by Zoom. My sister just, you know, implemented a clever thing that our family has never done before. She just in implemented a, a Sunday afternoon family Zoom conference. And uh, so me and my three siblings and everything else get the opportunity now to, to start to engage in a way that we usually don't think to. Like we go about our busy lives and connect every couple months, but now we can connect every week and, and spend time mm -hmm. really talking about what's important to us as a family. So um, think about how you're going to reconnect to your family in, in a more deep way than just a text message or a meme or something. And let's let's really start to talk about what's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there is a interesting recalibration that is taking place with this sequestration that's compelling us to take inventory of our daily habits and to get clarity on what's truly important versus extraneous. And with that, I'm seeing an increase in the level of social connectivity in my own personal life and just observationally with other people. Your example of the Zoom call is, you know, perfectly encapsulates that. Like people are discovering Zoom and despite our geographic separation, I'm seeing a more coherent social conversation happening right now. There is a unification occurring because of the fact that this is impacting all of us in such a unprecedented way. And there is something beautiful about that. And my hope is that, you know, a wonderful flower <laughs> will come out of that, that will precipitate uh, a change in, in, you know, the systems that cohere to create the scenario that we find ourselves in right now. Um, I will say also that you're probably not aware of this because you're in Oahu, but San Francisco and also Los Angeles just closed their parks today. So that's no longer the case. Although I would say, you know, I, I have trails, as you know, that surround my house. And that's really where I'm finding peace every day, being able to go out and trail run or, or get out on my bike. And generally when I'm out on the trails, I might see one or two or three other people. But recently, it's been the most socially congested aspect of my day. So many people are getting outside and going on these family walks, so much so that you have to kind of, you know, take a wide berth around them when you're running to, to maintain that social distance. Uh, but it's been interesting. There's a, you know, I suppose a, uh, there's, a, there's a great positivity in that and that people for the first time ever, it was like a log jam of cars parked in the little parking lot at the trailhead that I go to typically, and I've never seen that before. Um, so that's a great thing. My hope is that despite parks being closed, that people will still find ways to get outside. I think that's crucial in this moment right now. Um, but I think to your point of the food supply being imperiled by what's happening, you know, in Los Angeles, when you go to the grocery store, they're only allowing people in a few at a time to make sure that there's no overcrowding in the grocery stores. And there's plenty of, of aisles where the shelves are bare. And my sense is that, you know, restocking is coming and we're not in any imminent threat of our food supply being imperiled to the extent that we're not gonna be able to eat, but it doesn't take much imagination to understand and realize that we're a hair's breadth away from that actually becoming a reality. And when you grasp the fact that the food that we produce in this country is going towards animal agriculture or it's getting exported overseas or being used to create um, you know, for processed fuel. <laughs> food and snacks and all of, yeah, or fuel or things like that, you realize once again, it goes back to the fragility of our systems. We're not in a situation in which we're robust enough to 
weather a crisis like that, again, the wake up call and, and the conversation that needs to happen is how do we create robustness in our food system and our energy supply? And in our you know, sort of popular unity, in our, in our kind of commercial consciousness that drives markets to uh, you know, create the systems that we need and deserve to basically you know, survive as a species while also maintaining the integrity of the planet. Sustainability, I guess, is what I'm getting at. I think that's you know all you know very well said, and you know I think we need to be coming to terms with the fact that whatever fear and anger we have around this virus and all this, if we keep projecting that at the virus, we're not going to realize that what we're really afraid of is is that our system is collapsing <laughs> and our vulnerabilities are profound and get worse every day, and so we need to fundamentally change all that, and we so easily can. And again, it, I really think it begins the food, like, you know, the healthcare system will write itself as soon as we fix the food system. And so uh, the regenerative effort that we have at Farmers Footprint has been interesting because the ripple effects are, are not what I expected. When I set out to make that documentary film, I didn't even set out to make a nonprofit initially because I didn't you know that the problem was so big. Um, I was just set out to tell a story of how damaging Roundup was to ecology of the rivers and ocean system and how it was affecting human health along those water systems. And then as soon as we got on our first farm, we realized, oh my gosh, there is a crisis and a vulnerability here that goes far beyond you know, the poisoning of our water systems. It's, it's the poisoning of the minds of humanity here uh, going on. And, uh, and so the story changed. And as soon as, you know, we started watching regenerative soil management practices come in on these farms, it was, again, the unexpected happened. It wasn't that, oh, great, the food's healthier and the nutrients are denser in the food. That's, again, the story I thought I was going to tell. All that happens, but it pales in comparison to the human journey in there. These farmers wake up with such, you know, optimism suddenly that that it's been missing for generations and they're like, I can, I can be an independent, autonomous farmer, and I can make money again, and my farm can make money, and my kids are coming back to the farm because they're seeing success, and they want to be a part of that. And you know, now there's a, you know, a, a plan for me to be able to pass off this farm to my children, and it's working. And like the the joy just eclipses even the economic or everything else. Human joy is just, just the most powerful of things that I've ever seen. I, I just am amazed by it. When, when you have true joy in your, in your being, it changes. You become this, this radical force. You, you become this, this entity that just is so much larger than your body at that point. And you, you can change everything, most of all your mindset and, and your, your vibration. And when you put yourself in a really high vibration state, Good stuff comes. It's it's just so obvious when you put yourself in a high vibration state. You could experience success and joy and human impact on levels that the current status of society isn't ready to let you know you can do. If you just embody that joy at a level and then surrender your expectations on what what's going to come out of that, and the joy is engendered not by big things, but it's engendered in the tiny little things. It's in the candlelight with your your lover that you've called your wife for years or your, your children or your, you know, new girlfriend or whatever it is that's in the, your space right now, that small human touch, that small human experience of being sequestered away for a moment and light those candles, look into each other's eyes and, and just express your gratitude to one another for being alive right now. Because the reality is we are just the tip of biology on the earth. The microbiome is always for life. It's never against life. If it appears that the microbiome is threatening us or killing us, it's because we have misaligned ourselves with nature at, at a large level. And we need to realign ourselves with that. And we need to start to, to think about what, what it looks like to be within our moment, living in as light beings at a high vibration in space and time with high consciousness, with a respect for human life, with a respect for animal life that's not happening on the planet. You know, people are right now, you know, saying again, oh, China makes this happen every year because they have all these animal markets and food markets and everything else. 
And the reality is, yes, that actually is a problem. When we're killing 60 billion animals a year for human consumption, that's a global problem. And that's not a Chinese problem. That is a global problem that we're killing 60 billion animals. But a bigger problem that those 60 billion animals are largely being held in captivity in these extremely toxic, you know, inhumane, you know, levels of management. And so if we see viruses coming out of that, well, that's the microbiome's check on, on the reality that we live in. There are checks and balances in biology, uh, certainly that work better than the checks and balances in our government. And, and life is going to have to re- be redirected if we oppose you know, health and, and ecology on that level. Really what you're getting at is developing a healthy dose of humility. And the recursive theme and everything that you've been talking about comes back to having in there being like equanimity in terms of our relationship to the planet, whether it's our food systems, whether it's you know how we interact with each other, we are out of whack and it's nature's way of reminding us that we need to reset and pay attention. And again, I keep saying this, but you know I don't wanna minimize what's happening. There are a lot of people who are scared and there are many people who are suffering and people are dying, uh, but I think you know, if we can really connect with this humility, we have an opportunity to embrace the opportunity to return with a more sort of synergistic relationship with our planet. I mean, farmer's footprint is a perfect example of that. By returning to what is natural and cyclical with the planet, these farmers have been able to find new life. And with that, uh, you know, a new happiness and a new lifeline for their families. And the domino effect of that is, is profound. And if we can extrapolate on that example to reflect back upon our own relationship to the planet and our behaviors and our consumer choices, I think it can be highly instructive going forward. At the same time, many of these things that we're talking about involve systems that are out of the control of the average consumer. How much impact can I really have on you know, our global supply chain, on our food system, on policy, on economics, on you know, what big pharma decides to do, et cetera. But what we can do is seize this moment of solitude and sequestration to really inventory and reflect on our own behavior patterns. Because the ecosystem that resides within each of us is just a microcosm of the macrocosm that we're experiencing externally right now. And for me, I've been kind of thinking about this in terms of, you know, through that lens, like how am I living? What in my life is not in balance? Where can I live more in alignment with nature's cyclical rhythms? Where can I, um, you know, find more balance in my day-to-day routine? And where am I blind or in denial about things that I'm doing that are perpetrating a problem that recurs in my own life? And I think the more that we can all adopt that practice, I think we all kind of emerge out of this, assuming that we can emerge out of it healthy, um, more empowered and stronger and um, more capable and humble and in a better position to create that world that we all can imagine for ourselves and yet seem so out of grasp at the moment. Yeah, I think, I think there is a danger of, of sense of hopelessness or helplessness on, on the level of the one. But I, I want to, again, bring it back to maybe just you know, one, one small family farm in Minnesota that you can, you know, that farmer's footprint 20 minute documentary was, you know, feature this one family and watching Grant and Don on their journey of self empowerment was, you know, profound to see what this one little family decided to do and the speed at which new community came to them when they were, had been completely ostracized and lonely because they had you know, made the decision in the middle of Minnesota to go into some sort of organic process or something like that. As soon as they kicked the, the, the common paradigm, they were literally ostracized socially and everything else. And so they were, were in one of the deepest states of loneliness and isolation and depression that you could put a, a family in. And then 
with just the simple decision to take care of Mother Earth under their feet and say, we're going to do the right thing for this 300 acres. And it's not our responsibility to figure out to do with the other 125 million acres in the United States. We're just going to take care of this little 300 acres. And as soon as they did that, they found new community around the world that had been, you know, taking care of soil for decades and had new you know, insights and, and resources and information and experience to share with them. And they now find themselves, you know, embraced by a global community and, you know, their kids coming back to the farm and, you know, the, the layers are so good. And all they had to do was the right thing at the small level. And, you know, now we see their story impacting an entire world of farmers. Uh, I just came out of Australia because we were launching a, a parallel program uh, to Farmers for Print in Australia in the next couple of months. And, you know, just to watch the impact that that film has had here to these, you know, farmers who, you know, never been to Australia probably and everything else. And yet they're impacting every sector of agriculture all over the world because they did the right thing on the small scale. And so that's what you can do with your family. At the end of World War II, we were growing 45% of our food in our backyard gardens. 45% of our food. Now we grow less than 0.1% of our food in our backyard gardens. You can be so powerful in growing, regrowing that garden. One of my favorite success stories, my clinic when I set it up back in 2010 was in one of the most impoverished areas of Virginia, uh, fifth generation poverty, no grocery stores in that, that county. People were eating out of gas stations as their primary food source most days. And, um, you know, it was, you know, the penultimate food desert, penultimate processed food nightmare. And I went in with my clinic to teach plant-based diet and to help people, you know, start to regain their health. And what I found out was it was not just their health that was, you know, had the opportunity to shift. It was actually their sense of autonomy and their sense of independence that they've been lacking for perhaps generations and the way that they did that was through planting a garden. And as soon as they planted a garden and found out they could produce their own food and that the immediate consequences of that was a reduction in their medication costs and co-pays for hospital visits, it was just like this unbridled sense of capacity. Uh, one of the African-American pastors that was coming to my uh, group, he was a fantastic reverend within the, the Black Baptist community in my area. And he got a hold of the message that if he regrew his garden, he, he could really have an impact on his own health. Here he was in his you know, late seventies when he came to my clinic and stage heart disease and diabetes, all the typical stuff. And uh, he, you know, heard this and remembered that his his grandmother had the largest garden in the entire community. And so he replanted this this four acre garden with three generations of his kids and grandkids and great grandkids. And within two years, he was feeding over 40 families out of their, their garden. Mm. And, you know, it's just like you just can't underestimate the power of doing the right thing in your backyard, on your porch, in your window. Do the right thing just at the tiny level. And again, this raises your vibration and bigger stuff will come. Keep Surrender the expectations of what it's going to look like and just do the right thing. And and you're going to enjoy it. One of the coolest things that you could do with your kids right now, it's not a great time for you to be growing perhaps and it takes a little time to get a crop in the ground or plant in the ground. So start with this. Start with salt, water, and a cabbage and get your kids involved or get your grandkids involved or whoever you, you're not sequestered away from right now and um, make a salt water brine, chop up the cabbage, drop it in the salt water, open it up to the microbiome of the air, and let the bacteria and fungi at millions of species potential come floating into that crock over the next day or two with just a towel over it. And then, you know, after a couple of days out, you can then decide to jar that or whatever you want, or you can just leave it in the crock and keep swiping the top every day and to keep the water clean. And over the next two weeks, you'll create one of the most amazing sauerkraut experiences you've ever had. And you can just let it keep going. <laughs> And uh, take a bite every couple of days and and experience yourself what the microbiome is doing to that food. And it will taste different every couple of days. And that experiment will cost you maybe a buck and a half. And it will totally change your perspective on your food system. Because right now you're spending 12 bucks for a little few ounces of sauerkraut that's vacuum packed in plastic and multiple levels of chemical. And you're paying 12 bucks to, to do that. And you can, for $1.50, make a huge untainted crock of sauerkraut 
this is where autonomy actually comes from is just this journey. And, you know, your, your wife is doing such an amazing job with her cheese company right now because she's doing the right thing. She's saying, let's, let's just ferment non-dairy and turn that into delicious food. And it will change our family. It will change our community as they realize this is in our grasp. We can actually create artisan food in our kitchens. We can create artisan food, you know, in our backyards. And this is where you guys became so successful in your plant-based movement is really bringing autonomy back into the household to be creative in the kitchen. Again, the colors that are in your cookbooks are just such a joy. And it's, it's a sense of you know beauty to the whole thing. And ultimately, if we're here for anything, it's to, to experience beauty and to recognize it and shout it from the rooftops when we see it and to celebrate it. And if you just do that in your day to day, if you dig into beauty and you start making sure that everything you do is grounded back to a pursuit of beauty, you're going to find a different life and you will, you know, save the American people from collapse in the process. And you will show the world that we can build a nation that's not about empires and sequestration of power and wealth and resources. We're about great co-creation. I think that's one of the shining lights of the American people is we are a profoundly creative group because we've been empowered at the self level. Uh, the Chinese people are not empowered to, to be individualistic in their pursuits. Um, but they come to America to, to participate in that. And they come to, to dig into a city like San Francisco or Chicago or New York for the opportunity to pursue creativity and, and beauty on their own terms. And so let's be that again. Let's, let's be the Ellis Island of the world again. And, and we can do that if we stop trying to take everything from everybody and make them do all our work. And we can start doing it by just being a, a co-creative society again, connecting humans to be co-creative rather than consumptive. And uh, w the world is our oyster. It, 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 it can all open up to bring more beauty into our lives. The pearls that are there waiting for us to see are the other cultures. There's such beauty in the Fijian people. There's such beauty in the Filipino people. There's such beauty in the faces of Honduras and El Salvador and Peru and, you know, South Africa. And, you know, we, we are missing the beauty for what, 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 is, what is distracting us? It's, it's our social media, it's our Instagram page and everything else. So um, it's, it's our 10,000 selfies, you know, like if we stop looking at our own face and go to see ourselves within the faces of everybody else, we'll see a much more beautiful picture of ourselves. And it begins with sauerkraut. I'm listening to you eloquently deliver <laughs> this beautiful speech. And all I'm doing is thinking about how I haven't been able to get it together to grow a garden at our house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same because Julie and I always revert to the excuse that we're so busy. And you know, in 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 hearing you, you know, it really is about the, the the simplicity of all of it, and and also you know, connecting with your neighbors. It's not about the global economy as much as it is about your local community. That's right. Yeah, and you know, I think that the American mind is quick to find failure and then use you know, multiple excuses in our failure. And, and so I think it's because we, we have such rigid belief systems about what a garden should be. It should have tomato and basils and eggplant and cucumbers and squash and peppers and blah, blah, blah. And if we don't get the time to do that and we don't do that, then we're like, well, we've been intending that for years. And then we hold that against ourselves. And I've started opening up my own definition of garden so that I stop seeing myself as a failure here. Uh, in our property in Virginia, um, we have you know six acres of beautiful woods that have really been untouched by chemical agriculture for uh, its entire history. And so it's just like, it feels like this national treasure whenever I'm in that space. We have like ancient, you know, uh, ground covers growing in the woods that date back, you know, 50 to 100 million years in the fossil record. And so we have like this incredible thing. And then I chipped out this, this garden, this little quarter acre garden over the, the last 10 years. And I never have that thing in good repair. 
but growing in that is an extraordinary amount of wildflowers now that have self-seeded and found their way in there. And when I go out there in the summertime now, the amount of butterflies, caterpillars, birds are just berserk. Like it's like every single millimeter of that that garden is crawling with life. And so I've expanded my my concepts for my own psyche in some ways, but also to expand past the concept of the tomato plant to realize, you know what? Mother nature doesn't need more tomato plants. Mother nature needs biodiversity. And so in your backyard, you could just start a butterfly garden and let the butterflies bring life in. And, you know, the moths at night uh, bringing life in there and be, there, these pollinators are, are going extinct at extreme rates and really are, you know, our harbinger of the extinction of, of life as we know it on the planet. And so you may not need to f- feed just you. You might be able to expand your ideas to feed Mother Earth again in her biodiversity and nature in her biodiversity. And so uh, growing in my garden right now is Jerusalem artichokes, which grow underground. They're kind of like a potato, but this literally looks like tiny little sunflowers at the top of these tall stalks and uh, in the middle of the summer. And they're beautiful to, to look at. And then they always flop over and look kind of ugly, I think, in, in, in the fall. But then I realized that that biomass that's now flopped over on the ground is now protecting my soil and it's creating all these microclimates for earthworms and everything else underneath there. And then you get to dig up the, the Jerusalem artichokes and literally these things are, are will take over large amounts of space. Plant one little tuber uh, of a Jerusalem artichoke and you're going to end up with, you know, a massive patch in a few years. And so my garden, totally un- unattended everything else, has this biomass and this food source that now covers you know, 15 square feet or something of these incredible things. And you pull all these sunflowers out of the ground and on their root systems are dozens of these little potato-like, uh, you know, nuggets. And those Jerusalem artichokes, also called sunchokes, are some of the most delicious food I've ever eaten. So I would just encourage everybody listening to think, you know, beyond just the little manicured cucumber tomato patch think about how do you create biodiversity out there and let it be messy mm-hmm. because nature is messy. She loves the, you know, the kindergarten approach to life, which is, you know, the finger painting and colors everywhere and no particular, you know, order, except that it, in its disorder, we realize a beauty that could have never been done in any form of symmetry or, or careful planning. So, so be raucous in your gardening, let it go wild if you need to. And if, if it quote unquote fails because you get too busy because your time is demanded by all the good things you're doing for the world, that's okay. Let it do its thing as well and let it realize its full potential as it would plan it, not as you would plan it. And let's not think of that as a failure. I like that. It feels like it gives me permission to begin because I do have in my mind like what it's supposed to look like. And to me, it's very intimidating. And I start to think about all the time it's gonna require, but the idea of just starting with one thing and being more in the allowing process and not beating yourself up, I feel like that is a good like motivator for me to finally get over myself and <laughs> commence that process. <laughs> so thanks for that. I think uh, it would be good to share with people a few things that they can do to buttress their microbiome in the meantime and and you know boost their immunity as much as possible other than, you know, look, the social distancing or the physical distancing, the getting a lot of sleep, you know, staying hydrated, you know, washing your hands, all the things that that you're gonna hear time and time again. What are some perhaps less intuitive things that people could be doing to make sure that they're taking care of themselves to the best extent possible? Yeah, it, it's um, critical for us to, to think about this. It's an extension of the garden we just talked about really. And so, um, the data coming out of China, again, in this great paper that just was released last week, um, is intriguing that they're finding that the unifying you know, risk of fatality from this virus is not the virus itself. It's the vulnerability that comes in the pneumonias and other conditions that come uh, after the virus infects you. And so uh, their unifying feature that they're finding in the, in the victims is this dysbiosis, there, which is a term to describe an unbalanced microbiome in the gut. And so uh, if you haven't been up on the last 10 years of medical science, every single condition on the planet has now been tied back to the microbiome. <laughs> that's, the, that's the nutshell mm-hmm. of the last 10 years of global science. And it's obvious in the end 
that what would grow a, a healthy tomato plant is going to be what's going to grow a healthy human. There's no way that biology can't be founded in the microbiome because it's literally where all of the nutrients and the fuel production and ultimately the communication for cell cell and, and trans species communications come from. And so to prepare yourself for resilience in this time as you know, and again, if you don't continue these things thereafter, we're going to see something much worse than than our current coronavirus situation. So this, again, is a template for long-term life, not just what you're going to do for the next few weeks while you're thinking about it. So how do you start to build this into your life? And this is literally what my companies have been doing since since our origin in 2010. So for the last decade, I've been steeped in this mindset of what is nutrition? How is it found in the microbiome? What is the microbiome? How is human biology founded in it? And so what we've discovered over the years is that a couple of really important aspects have, have gone missing from our daily experience. And a lot of it has to do with carbon, which is interesting because carbon is actually the backbone of biology. And to, to, to become a doctor or a microbiologist or anything in the health sciences, you have to, to take organic chemistry. And the word organic chemistry means carbon chemistry. The word organic refers to life built on carbon structure. And so it may seem very foreign to you at the moment, but I want you to start to re-envision life on Earth as a series of carbon molecules. That being the case, you need to start to think about carbon as the most important thing that you, you can do for yourself. And carbon in the human experience is the nutrients that we consume. And so uh, sugar is a, a large carbohydrate string of, of, of carbon molecules. And so it can come in the form of glucose, fructose, galactose, all these different you know, carbon chains. And then they get cleaved down to just the same you know, little carbon molecule of CO2 in the end. Fatty acids are the other form of fuel. There's only two forms of fuel for cellular biology as we know it, a multicellular organism from an earthworm to human. It has to do with the carbon chains of carbohydrates and the carbon chains of fatty acids. And all these diets that fight over should you be high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, all that, the mitochondria just sit here and laugh at us, I think, because they're the same thing. They're, they're carbon strings that as soon as they go into a mitochondria, which is the only thing that can use either one, is going to cleave that down to release energy as it cleaves those carbon chains and release CO2. And so the mitochondria are going to do the exact same thing. In fact, a fatty acid and a, a glucose molecule become the exact same molecule, acetyl-CoA, in, an, in a two-enzyme step for it to enter the mitochondria. It goes to acyl-CoA, and so in a single step, actually, it goes to the same molecule. So glucose, fat, single enzyme, turns into acyl-CoA. Second enzyme, acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA becomes the entire you know, energy source, and in producing the energy that would then produce CO2, it releases electrons. And the electrons become our communication system. And so that's where we've been focused as a company is understanding how do bacteria take the carbon, turn it into bioactive agents, and communicate through that system to engender health, longevity, regeneration, all of these things that are so fascinating. And so in the, in the nutshell, what you can start to do is look for the most clean sources of complex carbohydrates and fatty acids that you can put your hands on. And so that's going to, again, come down to the garden. So seeds, nuts, and, and legumes are your fantastic sources of fatty acids. Uh, your complex carbohydrates are easy in that. It's anything with, with beautiful color in it, basically, on the plate. And so it's your, your vegetables, your fruit. Uh, but also think, you know, under the ground is an important one. So that, that your root vegetables are really rich in, in these carbon sources in their skins in particular. So the skin of a carrot the skin of a potato, these have basically the entire periodic chart, but they're also very rich in these, these soil carbon compounds. And so think root vegetables uh, as a source because not only do they have that micronutrient and carbon density, they also have uh, this very you know, important aspect of fiber. And fiber in your diet is really the building block for microecosystems within your gut. And the fiber supports diversity of microbial species. And the, the microbes that are missing from the guts of the Chinese people that are dying from coronavirus in this paper last week are the very bacteria that go missing when you eliminate fiber from your diet. And so I'm intrigued by the paper because it's basically pointing to what we've seen over and over again through all human diseases. If you eliminate fiber from your diet, 
you start to suffer. If you eliminate complex carbohydrates from your diet, your microbiome shifts and it shifts to a fermentation rather than uh, an aerobic uh, digestion. And the fermentation, the Firmicute uh, bacteria uh, are very closely linked to this chronic inflammatory state of the gut and immune system. And so uh, it's very exciting when I see that paper because the first thing that we can do is get people eating from the ground as fast as possible. So let's get you know, our plant-based diets wrapped up. Let's go to the root vegetables. We're looking at sweet potatoes. We're looking at uh, your radishes. Uh, the daikon radish is a super interesting one there that doesn't get recognized much. But your red radishes, your black radishes, your, your the white radish of the daikon looks like a giant carrot. Um, your carrots themselves, the heirloom carrots, the purple and the, and the, the white and the, and the orange carrots, and leave the skins on these things. For goodness sakes, we just go and skin these things immediately and then just eat the starch out of the middle of a potato. Leave the skins on and get the whole experience here of, of the complexity that you need. And so that's where it begins. The other thing that then is lacking after all of that is in the current human experience is the microbiome itself. And so this is a little bit more complicated uh, because it takes a little bit more effort on your part than just putting the right vegetables on your plate. But what's been missing uh, increasingly because of our antibiotic environment is the carbon uh, communication network of the microbiome. And so now that we're, you know, in the U.S., we put about 38 million pounds of antibiotics into our animal feed a year. We put about 8 million pounds of antibiotic into our humans through physician offices and prescriptions. And then we put 300 million pounds of, of antibiotic in the form of Roundup and glyphosate into our soils and water systems every year uh, through uh, chemical farming. The, the scale of that antibiotic is really, you know, multiplied by the fact that the chemical of glyphosate and Roundup is water-based. And so it now ends up in the air we breathe. 75% of the air we breathe in any agricultural state is contaminated with Roundup. 75% of the rainfall in our agricultural states are contaminated with Roundup. And when I say agricultural states, that's most of them, right? That's one of the main economies of any state. And so we're all breathing and being rained on and eating and drinking these antibiotics. And so what's happened is we've lost biodiversity in the gut. And uh, with that, we've become very vulnerable in many, many ways. And the primary thing that we've been working on as, as a science group in our laboratories for the last eight years is to understand how did the soils you know, do this historically and how can the ancient soil give this back to us? So for the last decade, you know, we've been working on the nutrition side, but in, for the last eight years, we've been working on the soil secrets. And we've been extracting for the last you know, eight years these small carbon molecules that act as the communication network because they can exchange electrons once they're activated with, with oxygen and hydrogen. You can exchange electrons, which means you can create communication between cells, importantly, between species. And so we've been extracting that. That product is now called Ion Biome. And so my company produces that. So this is the most biased part of this entire podcast and take this with a giant <laughs> you know, grain of salt if you want. But um, for the last eight years, we've been showing that when you, you take these carbon molecules and get oxygen and hydrogen to bind them again in our, la our production center and then put that into a bottle and then give that to a human, something amazing happens. It's, it, it gives me goosebumps every time somebody is about to put this in their mouth because humans have only been around 200,000 years and the, the, molecular intelligence, the biodiversity that we're tapping into is actually 60 million years old. So we're taking soil that's 60 million years old, it's been compressed into an ore called leonardite, and then we extract the carbon molecules, small carbon molecules, and then we make oxygen and hydrogen bind those carbon molecules again so that they become non-reactive and non-inflammatory. And then we put that into a human system. And suddenly you have a you know, billions and billions of versions of these little carbon snowflakes, each species of bacteria and fungi from 60 million years ago, sending their own little signal, their own message of intelligence into this system. And then you put a human species that's only 200,000 years old into this level of intelligence. And what happens under the microscope is mind blowing because it's never been seen. You see fundamental healing repair and, and three dimensional structures coming back into rapid function that doesn't happen in petri dishes. Petri dishes are where we study disease and collapse because we can't study health and healing because that usually takes complex, you know, systems of biology and intact immune system. It takes, you know, messaging from distant, you know, uh, cellular types in the human biology to make healing happen. 
it started happening in a Petri dish in 2013 with our first studies. And it blew our minds because it wasn't supposed to happen. You aren't supposed to get healing in a human cell system in a Petri dish isolated. And the answer that's come out over the last seven years is exciting is we keep thinking how human biology is human. Human bi biology is based in the microbiome itself, the biology itself. And so it's extraordinary to realize that if you put back in the communication network of bacteria and fungi, human cells know how to repair themselves, know how to start building cooperative three-dimensional structures with one another. It's not a sterile Petri dish anymore. There's no bacteria and fungi in there because it is a sterile liquid that we extract. But the communication of that vast ecosystem is intact and, and firing. And when the cell has unfettered access to information, it always goes into a regenerative state. And I think that's a lesson for life right there. Biology at its foundation is grace. Grace in my mind is, is you know, extending the opportunity for healing faster than the damage happens. And so uh, biologic grace is realized here as we see biologic systems collapse under the pressure of decades of roundup. And then you put back communication network and in a matter of not years or decades, but in a matter of minutes, you start to see this regenerative capacity come out of uh, the human gut. And, and the way in which that happens is the human gut starts to cooperate as a single organism again. Uh, human biology is really begins at this inside outside understanding of an intact gut. Your gut lining is two tennis courts in surface area. And when you consume Roundup, it destroys that structure. Interestingly, alcohol also does that. And so if you drink excessive amounts of alcohol, it will also do the, the Roundup injury of destroying the tight junctions. And you get you know, a breakdown in this, this primary barrier between you and, and the outside world. And so with that collapse you know, of that system, we lose self-identity at the biologic level. And we get chronic inflammation. We get major depression. We get hopelessness, we get suicide, all of this from a collapse of that gut lining. When that gut lining goes back up and the microbiome helps us rebuild that, we get to, to accelerate into this journey of self-identity, self-hope, uh, anti-inflammatory capacity, reservoirs of, of uh, resources to repair, and we go into resilience and we go into regeneration because the microbiome is talking to us. The teachable moment there for me is the simple truth that there is no separation between us and the world that surrounds us. That in fact, you know, our microbiome is is outward facing. It is it is technically outside of us, right? And the fact that it is, you know, premised upon these age old principles that predate humankind is not only humbling, but instructive in the sense that if we can find a synergistic relationship with our environments that our complex systems of biology tend to respond in kind to you know maintain our health and well-being. Yeah, you're spot on, and and I think I'm I'm constantly more amazed and intrigued by the macro consequences of that. And so, when we repair this at the microscopic level, we repair this amazing boundary of the human gut. And self identity becomes real again for the immune system and and for this. We see an immediate, you know, within weeks or months, we see an immediate shift in the in the human psyche to healthy boundaries. And suddenly, people who have been in abusive relationships will come back to my clinic and say, you know, Doc, I'm just in total joy and amazement because I just left my husband who's been abusing me for thirty years, and I just finally saw my self worth, and I. I and it took me years of hearing these stories before I, I made the correlation of like, oh my gosh, isn't that obvious? When we build our microscopic boundaries, our macroscopic boundaries become possible again. When we're in the overwhelm of microscopic injury and loss of self-identity at the microscopic level, and we have to react to everything outside of us, suddenly we're in, you know, we're sensitive to food, we're, sensitive, we're allergic to food, we're sensitive to the environment, or we're allergic to the environment. You know, all of these things are becoming a reality for so many of our children. One in four children are now either allergic to their the air they breathe or, or the food they eat. And so we are losing that self-identity. And when we're in that that collapse that we get chronic inflammation and there is no reservoir for creative thought or sense of self-protection or a sense of self opportunity. We're just in chaos control, damage control all the time. And so to move somebody out of that damage control straight at the microscopic level moves them into this potential at the macroscopic level, at the, at the consciousness level to become, you know, have a moment to breathe, to have a moment to, to, to listen to self 
to see why are you actually here? What are you here to do? What is your deep soul purpose? What, what are you going to do with that? It's coming out of this gut intelligence. And so that's, that's why we rebranded our products and everything else was intelligence of nature became our tagline. And so ION product line was to, to emphasize that intelligence is built into the fabric of nature. And it's how nature works so well. You know, right now I'm looking out at this extreme expanse of, of green stuff. There's palm trees bent over in the wind right now and rain blowing by. And it, it's so perfect in every shape and every sign. And there's, you know, all of these cascading mountains that have been biologically, you know, intact for, for millions and millions of years. And the ecosystems are bountiful. You can't have all of that beauty if, if not for the, the intelligence of the system beneath it. The coordination of the beauty that we see is communication. And so as humans, we need to learn from that. Our communication networks need to change. And so I'm, maybe a future podcast will talk about this because it's one of my biggest passions about what we're going to do with the internet in the next couple of years. But we need to, to fundamentally change the internet to start to mimic nature, which is everything should have unfettered access to information. And if, if it does, then we're going to build beauty. We're going to build cooperative structures and everything else. When every interaction is exploited by a third party for advertising and otherwise, we don't have unfettered access to information. Our information is fact warped and it's telling us only the reality that it wants us to see. And we're not seeing the reality for what it is. And so we behave in a certain way. So we, it reinforces our consumptive behavior. This is the kind of stuff that we get excited about as a company is, if we start to mimic the communication network that we found in the microbiome and we start to build societies like that, that's how we're going to escape this extinction event that we're headed towards. We can go extinct in the next 70 to 100 years on our current course, or we could literally become a different society. We could literally become a different species as we start to embrace the, the template that the microbiome is revealing to us. So... Once we get this carbon substrate going here and we start to, to build a, a, an infrastructure of communication within the, the guts of our patients and our families, we then ask them to do the bigger thing, which is now go plug back into nature and let the microbiome re, re manifest in your gut. And when this carbon substrate is, is rich in the gut and the communication network is there, it allows micro niches to quickly develop. And so you can get within just days of, of supporting that carbon communication system, you can see a bulking of the stool, you can see an increase in biodiversity within the gut, and you can see resolution of you know, long-standing imbalances that have been present there, not because the, the product is changing, anything. it's just giving back communication and unfettered communication leads to balance, leads to, to biodiversification. And, and I, I think that we need to start to, to mimic that across all systems. But the next step then is to, to do it at the macro level, which is get back in touch with nature. So as soon as you put this product in your mouth, then we're asking our patients to get outside into environments that you don't usually go to. National parks, to my knowledge, nobody's closed the national parks yet. That's uh, probably coming next 24 hours or something like that. But yeah, I would imagine. while the national parks are still open, th think about you know hitting a national park. And if you have to wait till after quarantine, then wait until after quarantine. But the point is, is you need to go into an ecosystem you haven't breathed recently because breathing, just like the sauerkraut that we do, uh, talked about earlier, is the result of the microbiome the air interfacing with a water structure of a crock or whatever you're making your sauerkraut in. You are a water structure that is calling for uh, the same microbiome support and interaction. And so go out and breathe. And so the hashtag breathe your biome that I created a couple of years ago remains one of our most successful campaigns we've ever done because people got so excited to take pictures of the children themselves interacting with new elements of nature. And uh, it's just a beautiful, you know, series of pictures. If you scroll through all that hashtag uh, breathe your biome, you're going to see, you know, kids in waterfalls and you'll see, you know, people on, on horseback out in the middle of nowhere. You'll see all kinds of just beautiful reconnection happening. And when you do that, you will, you will get fed by nature and you'll plug back in and you will have that, that microscopic experience of biodiversity. And you're going to have the macro experience of biodiversity because you're going to meet new people. You're going to see new faces. You're going to realize that humanity is even bigger and more beautiful than you thought just a day ago. And you're going to re-engage. And so ultimately, how are we going to be resilient to this virus? We're going to eat from the ground. We're going to experience the intelligence of the microbiome. We're going to, you know, 
really go after nutrient density to support uh, biologic systems. But more than that, we're going to change our environment. If your health is not at its full potential, it's because your environment has limited your, your potential. And so you need to expand your concept of, of what is your daily life and what kind of microbiome is it advancing. You and I have talked about it before, I think, on some of our previous mm -hmm. ones. But the typical experience, you know, of the American consumer right now is you wake up on a mattress that's off-gassing carcinogens and you go and you wash yourself down with a bunch of chemically infused soaps and, and skin products that have, on average, 180 different chemicals by the time you've gotten out of the house. You put on makeup that's got another 185 chemicals in it. And then you stumble into your car and the car is off gassing plastic and air conditioned and you're driving down a highway that's steeped in, in your pollution. Then you get to your office and you take a few steps outside into the office and now you're in a closed air conditioned space and you're in a carpeted cubicle and off gassing junk again. And then you go to the grocery store and you pick up food that you have came from half a world away and got transported, picked unripe and transported under ethylene gas to, so it ripened. And then uh, now you're eating what looks like a kale salad, but it's actually loaded with Roundup. And, you know, it just goes on and on. That's, can you believe we're even surviving that? Should we be surprised that we're vulnerable? <laughs> the human right being now? Like that's, is <laughs> incredibly resilient to be able to not only survive, really but speaks to procreate and thrive in that environment. So far, um, you know, interestingly, we're not thriving and, and we're not procreating very well anymore. Right. Uh, it's you know, now that you bring that up, it's worth saying that the sperm counts in all Western countries have dropped by fifty-two to fifty-seven percent in in my short lifetime, and so um, we are now seeing one in three males with uh, sperm counts less than fifteen million per milliliter, which is the infertility level. Mm -hmm. And so we are that curve hasn't flattened it out. That's a straight line towards the bottom and uh, has not leveled off. And so, um, we're, that's, that's the extinction event is we're losing the capacity to procreate. We're losing the capacity, uh, for human life. And we're, when we are alive, we burden it with chronic disease levels that have never been seen before from autism in our children to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's of our elderly, our cancer burden out 50%. It's just like, you know, we are failing as a biologic species because of the collapse of biology beneath our feet, beneath our gut, beneath the soils uh, that, that dwell around us. And so um, we're, we're, we're in the throes of an extinction event. We're losing 10,000 time increase in our extinction rate to the point where we're losing a species every 20 minutes. Um, and that's all happened in the last three decades. And the dominant feature of that is certainly chemical farming. So can't push hard enough for your for you embracing farmers footprint as an audience take a look at everything we're doing this touches your backyard again uh, we're just scaling up non-toxic neighborhoods that was created by brilliant woman kim conti and uh, she was just a concerned mother in irvine california and uh, she came back from living abroad uh, for many years and brought her young kids back into irvine california and then started seeing signs posted uh, about uh, you know, don't stay off the grass for 20, for 24 hours because it's been sprayed. And she was alarmed. She's like, what are we spraying on these? Find out that we're spraying all of our playing fields and parks with Roundup. And she was extremely dismayed and started to non-toxic neighborhoods and has done a beautiful job. Um, over 35 cities and counties around the, the country, including LA County and now San Diego County, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Miami, uh, many others around the country have gone Roundup free or, or, implementing roundup bans in their public places, uh, parks and, and city spaces and playing fields, et cetera. And so that's part of the farmer's footprint. You can dig in at farmersfootprint.us and realize that the third larger crop we grow in the United States, right behind corn and soybean, is lawn. And so the backyard lawn is our third largest crop, covering 40 million of acres at the United States. And it's mm. one of our most chemically demanding crops that we do. And that starts in your backyard, but extends to your children's soccer fields, football fields, playing fields. And perhaps the most toxic thing we see in all of that acreage is the, the golf courses. And so if you're a golfer, you need to start to really work uh, to revise the, the practices. We need to redefine our aesthetics of golf back to where it was in Ireland, where a rough was a rough. It was, it was a cover crop out there. There was multiple species. It was grassland. It wasn't, uh, you know, a, a monoculture of, of, Kentucky bluegrass growing a little bit longer. 
um, we need to start to redefine these these nature spaces that we we spend time on and uh, get them clean. So join non-toxic neighborhoods in the fight there. Um, it's exciting to see uh, consumers making uh, real success with local government when the federal government continues to be so resistant to change. The EPA just again proved Roundup for another 13 years uh, of use in the United States, saying that it, the evidence is not strong enough to say that it's dangerous to public health, which is just ludicrous at this point. But um, I'm just grateful that our local leaders are are not agreeing with that and are taking strong stands with our with our concerned parents and cleaning up our environment. So um, we got a lot to be excited about there. And uh, in the end, I think that all of us are going to create the change we want to see if we can see the problem at hand. Well, I'm grateful for the work that you're doing, that you will do, that you have done. Um, and this has been as edifying and illuminating as <laughs> as I predicted it would. And I think I want to close just by saying, you know, kind of calling out to the audience to really remind everybody that we are in an unprecedented moment right now. And my hope, my aspiration is that it will provide us with the necessary pause that I think is required to reflect on systems gone awry and what is broken and non-functioning in our society right now and give us the bandwidth and the opportunity to imagine the better, more sustainable and ecologically sound uh, world that I think is well within our grasp. Absolutely, that's beautiful. Uh, so, you know, I want to just close with reaching out to the physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs that are out there right now on the front lines in New York and Philadelphia and all the other cities that are starting to see the impact of this, this situation we're in right now. And um, I just want to, you know, acknowledge your effort and the fear that you're feeling and the exhaustion you're feeling and uh, the state of overwhelm that you sense and the vulnerabilities that you're you know, so poignantly aware of right at the moment. And uh, I just want you to know that we so deeply appreciate your commitment and your efforts in this time. We know the extremity of the situation you're in and uh, look forward to the end of that in the coming weeks as, as this passes over us. And um, in the meantime, I just want to reflect for a moment about again, redefining your role, uh, just like we did with the garden. Uh, we need to, to let go of uh, maybe the expectations that you're going to heal everybody and you're going to save everybody's life. And we need to really look at both sides of the physician or, or care team's experience. On the one side, we are all trained to be technicians. Uh, we're trained to, to adjust the knobs on the ventilators. We're trained to adjust the drips on the IVs. We're trained to read all the data and we're trained to write all the notes and look at all the risk factors and fill out the insurance forms. All of that is coming to a crisis point. It's not working. And that happens every day in an ICU where all the technology at hand finally fails and there's nothing more we can offer and the patient's dying. And then there's a second half to the journey that is the definition of that being a physician state or being a caretaker, being a nurse is when you set down the machinery and you sit down with the patient and say, we've done our best. We have done everything we know how to do. And we acknowledge that you are alive and we acknowledge that you are here with us in this moment. And we acknowledge that you're gonna likely expand to the other side of this rebirth that we call death. And in that time with your patients right now, I want you to know that we see the greatest victory right there. Because ultimately, as physicians and practitioners, we don't actually save lives. We don't have that level of capacity or responsibility. Life is something much greater than human. Life is a gift, and it's not your responsibility to maintain it. It's your responsibility to show up and, and bring the highest level of compassion, skill, uh, capacity that you can. But you will do your highest work when you recognize that this miraculous life that we live, this miraculous gift of life is transient. It is temporal. And it is our calling to be present with that and acknowledge it and see the beauty in every phase of it. And when you've got a young person who's dying or an elderly person who's dying, it's easy to get caught up in the emotions of the loss, but we need to, to get better and, and celebrate the moment of acknowledging the gain 
this is a life well lived. This is a person who is, uh, you know, created in their lifetime. This is a person who's loved in their lifetime. This is a person who's really in it uh, for them, for the big, big story of what it means to be human. And this was a soul that came in on purpose and has lived some version of that purpose. And uh, we acknowledge that. And so I hope that in the same way that the mess of a messy garden can start to look like a victory, the mess of healthcare can be very victorious if we recognize each other's humanity in it. And if we really embrace the beauty of human life and consciousness, that becomes often most poignant and most obvious when we're about to lose it. And we let go of that human consciousness to plug into something much, much bigger. And uh, I, I hope that you get to see, as the, the veil thins with your patients right now, I get to, get to see that other side and realize that they have no fear on the other side of that veil. And so as they're coming back and forth out of consciousness and back into consciousness in those last few minutes and hours and days, I hope that you get a glimpse of the beauty on the other side and a state of being that's free of fear, free of a uh, sense of loss and only sees opportunity and expansion and light. And uh, so take, take this opportunity to, to, to let down the expectations on yourself and uh, give up on a sense of failure. Let go of your sense of failure in those moments when the, the ventilator is failing, the oxygen is failing, the numbers are going south. Don't let that define your, your success. Uh, be present with your patients right now. Let, let them not die in vain. Let them be part of the message that this virus is trying to teach us. Let their journey be part of you. Reach out to them and hold their hands right now and give them a sense of deep purpose in this extreme thing that they've been called to. If they're called to pass right now, let them know it's not in vain that we're going to learn from this, that we are realizing that we have taken too many steps away from our purpose, our, our real nature, our real potential, and that they are doing their highest work right now in walking the journey of dying in this situation uh, to teach us a deep lesson of what it means to be connected and disconnected and, and a pathway towards reconnection and let them know that their highest victory is at hand and, and that they are part of the rise of human consciousness and not the collapse of biology on the planet. Um, that's that's what I want you to grab right now, and um, just know that I just am in deep gratitude for your courage to keep showing up. Love you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Rich. For I don't know. I never know what to expect whenever I. <laughs> free to do one of these with you it never turns out like i expect <laughs> but that was beautiful you. thank you for being so present and a lovely love letter um to the people that are on the front lines who are seeing the suffering firsthand and suffering themselves so that's much needed in this conversation right now and so thank you for that I think that's gonna be very helpful to a lot of people. And more will be revealed. Hmm. More will be revealed. That's hopeful. Right. So perhaps we'll do this again. Uh, I'd like to check in with you and see how you're doing. And, uh, and let's stay in touch. I look forward to it. All right. Thank you, Rich. And thank you everybody in this audience. You've had such an impact on my life. Um, thank you for the hope you've brought me and the joy you've brought me and uh, thank you for your continued engagement. Until next time. Thanks, man. Thank you. Peace. Plants. Mind-blowing as always, how much do we love Zach Bush? Hope you guys enjoyed that and that you take Zach's wisdom to heart. You can learn more about Zach at zachbushmd.com. For his written perspective on coronavirus and recommended resources, visit zachbushmd.com forward slash coronavirus dash statement. And for those interested in regenerative farming and Zach's nonprofit initiatives that we discussed today, visit farmersfootprint.us. 
Zach also wanted me to mention that his biology base camp home health programs, including a new program released just this week at a lower price called Biology Base Camp Community, can be found at intrinsichealthseries.com. As always, links to all the aforementioned and much more can be found on the episode page at richroll.com. And if you would like to support the work we do here on the show, subscribe, rate, and comment on it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Share the show or your favorite episodes with friends or on social media, and you can support us on Patreon at richroll.com forward slash donate. I wanna thank my team who worked hard to put on today's show, Jason Camiello for audio engineering, production, show notes, and interstitial music. Blake Curtis and Margot Lubin, who typically video the podcast, although today is audio only. Jessica Miranda for her beautiful graphics. Leia Marisovich for her portraits of Zach and myself. Georgia Whaley for copywriting. DK for advertiser relationships and theme music by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Hari Mathis. Thanks for the love, you guys. See you back here in a couple days with our regularly scheduled programming. Until then, be safe, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and seize this moment to go inward, to grow, and to love more deeply. Peace, plants, namaste.